Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. As little as long ago or as far away as forever. This is where we meet to celebrate what never was as it comes to pass. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We're completing a third in the series that I've been doing with Peter Moon on the Busiji Mountain discoveries and its connections to a hall of records, a holographic library said to have been created uh, by giants over 50,000 years ago, according to the star chart alignment that comes up when the history of the world is replayed in review. Peter, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can, and I thank you for joining us again for a a third part in the story. Um, Hopefully this evening we'll be able to complete uh, the fullness and to bring, catch everybody up on uh, where it is and, you know, with the other, the remaining two books that we have to, to cover. And, um, and if we need to, certainly we can extend, um, into another show, but let me give you a chance to give out your website and your, um, uh, sky books and where people can go to support your work. And also, if you want to mention, talk a little bit about the two videos that you just recently released in connection to the, um, time travel, uh, that would be fine as well. Certainly, um, this is a very appropriate time for that. Um, for those who are new to your audience, my name is Peter Moon. I'm a writer and publisher that is primarily known for my work uh, writing about time travel, the Montauk Project Experiments in Time that I wrote with a scientist named Preston Nichols. Uh, lo- lo- later, uh, a, a, another time travel scientist named Dr. David Anderson came into my life in 1999 after he had visited Romania, and he was dead set on getting me to Romania for what reason one can best imagine, but uh, because it's, he just thought it would be a great experience for me. So, and, and for the uh, people that I uh, talk to or lecture at, uh, at this camp I go to every year, which I'll be going there in August called Atlanticron that meets in southeastern Romania on uh, an island in the Danube every uh, the first week of every August. Now, David uh, frequently was a guest lecturer there. He ended up sponsoring the camp uh, under the world auspices of the World Genesis Foundation, which I'm now a board member of. He's the founder of that organization, um, the purpose of which is to you know, give every kid a chance. And, uh, because, and, and this is an underdeveloped world over there in Romania. So there's uh, courses, uh, lectures on sports, usually martial arts. I teach Qigong over there. There's uh, science, there's art, uh, there's science fiction. It's, it's basically a concordance of writers, artists, and scientists. Now, uh, so that's a little bit about how I got involved in Romania. Now, uh, the we had talked uh, in earlier shows about the first two books in the series, Transylvania Sunrise, which is a book that um, is written by a Romanian author, Redu Sinemar. And for those of you who are familiar, uh, he has surfaced. 
He has surfaced awesome. for the first time in about six years, but he hasn't uh, spoken to me uh, at this particular time. But he has surfaced, he has spoken to my publisher for the first time in about six years or five years. Uh, and, and this is, uh, you know, uh, noteworthy. I have also had David Anderson surface for the first time in a year, although he has not said anything uh, either other than that, you know, he regrets being out of touch um, and that he will be reviewing my work shortly. Now, those uh, I make those comments for people who, uh, who have been following my work already, and we will lead up to that. Uh, that leads up to where I'm going this August in Romania, but uh, to mention, as you had mentioned, there was uh, the first book, Transylvania Sunrise, is all about the intrigue of the, uh, uh, you know, a, an, a, an alliance between the Romani the secret uh, Department Zero of the Romanian government with the a secret part of the Pentagon uh, to dig up this chamber underneath this 50,000-year-old Romanian sphinx, and which has a holographic readout of the history of the universe. It also has uh, holographic records of your DNA and of any DNA from all over the universe. It would, it would show you in holographic form the planet and the star system it came from, and you could put your hands over this table is how you would determine it. And then you could put your hand over another part of the table and it would show out another sample of uh, species from another planet or this planet. And then you could, when you put them over simultaneously, it would mix the two species. Um, and you could see a hybrid of that species. So basically, and, and this was about six feet high. It was, uh, the table was, it was uh, made for people that were much taller than, than we are. And it also had three tunnels in this chamber going into the inner earth. It was very, what you would call high tech. And they didn't know, they, now it, what I speak here and what's written in that book is only about after six weeks of investigating the chamber. That was in 2003. This chamber has been uh, known about, accessed for uh, 13 years since then. And we'll be talking a little bit about uh, where they went in that chamber, what they did with that chamber uh, with the third book, uh, which is called Mystery of Egypt. I should mention the second book, because um, that parlays into the fourth book, which we'll be discussing. Um, the, the second book, of course, the first book ends with the, the author Radu Cinemar being able to visit the chamber so that he can write about it. A lot of that book has to do with all of the politics and intrigue of getting at the chamber, um, the games that were going on between uh, the Italian Freemason who instigated it, uh, the head of Department Zero in Romania, and the um, and the Americans. Now, the second book, to, to be very brief, is that Radu is befriended by a Chinese doctor, actually a Tibetan Lama, who turns out to be the Chinese doctor from book one, who set up this Department Zero for the Romanians from as a communist Chinese, but he was really a Tibetan Lama, and he tutored and oversaw, mentored the head of Department Zero, Cesar Brad, who was a very gifted psychic, who would basically be the person who oversaw the opening of this chamber at, for the Romanian side. So anyway, we go into uh, book two, when Radu is contacted by the Lama as a Lama, and the Lama uh, takes him to, uh, with the help of an alchemist named Eleanor, who is uh, uh, discovered, he's part of a long tradition of alchemy, which enables you to live forever, uh, or, or at least thousands of years, provided you don't have a physical accident. So there's a whole chapter on alchemy that's quite astounding. The first chapter in that book, Transylvania Moonrise. The, uh, and then they, uh, Eleanor and the Lama and Radu go to um, Transylvania, where they go through what is called a space transfer. And they end up in Tibet, where he goes, and, and it's higher than you could normally breathe. Their breathing is facilitated through a creature called a yidam that 
uh, joins them in Transylvania and helps facilitate the space translation. A Yidam is the product of a, uh, a Tibetan San Mandala, that a Tibetan Lama, after he reaches a very high state of evolution for a Lama, he can uses this Yidam, he creates this, it's a creature Yidam that is created with the use of a San Mandala. Um, and then this Yidam is like a functional creature. Uh, it could be a fairy, it could be an elf, it could be a leprechaun. In this case, it's a seven foot tall, uh, something that looks, sounds like, uh, you know, it looks like lurch or something, you know, it's, it's big. And anyway, this Yidam has supernatural abilities because it is an extension of the Lama's mind, which can go into physical territories that a normal human being like a Lama could not uh, stand up to. And he facilitates the space translation. He facilitates their ability to breathe, at which point Radu goes into a cave where he sees this beautiful blue goddess named Mashande, um, who identifies with what is called the Durga in the Hindu tradition. The Durga is a, the sort of the feminine essence that exists in every woman. And this is an embodiment of it. And she basically gives Radu a manuscript that is called a terma that was hidden by the second Buddha, who's the founder of Tibetan Lamaism, a Buddhist Lamaism, not the original Lamaism. And uh, this, this is supposed to signal a great uh, occurrence in the universe when this, this terma, which gives basically... Uh, rules for successful living, but it, it signals a, a time when things will start to move and happen anytime one of these termas is discovered. And Radu is the, uh, what's called a, um, I think he's called a, I forget, I think the name is Terpa, but he is the one who facilitates the terma. Uh, and this is in the Buddhist traditions, and the Buddhists recognize this. So in any case, this uh, parchment is taken back uh, to Transylvania and it is Radu's job to basically write write the book about it but it has to be translated by the Lama because it's in an ancient Tibetan script that a modern Tibetan person wouldn't understand too well so the Lama himself had to study it the Lama by the way speaks English and he speaks um, obviously Tibetan it, he speaks Chinese, but he does not speak Romanian. So in any case, um, this is uh, the, a, a little summary of the first two books. And, and the third book, um, excuse me for that. Um, the third book is called Mystery of Egypt. And this has to do with the exploration of one of the tunnels in this chamber beneath the Buchej Mountains, where the Sphinx is. Um, the, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to have to disconnect this thing. Pardon me. Yeah, no problem. We'll be, he'll be right back, everyone, and then we'll continue. Yeah, I, I, I'm back. I'm back. I just had to. Okay, uh, well, question, just a couple questions, and then continue, please continue. It's a good time but, for questions. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I wanted to know if you could tell where, you know, where each one of the tunnels go to, and then also if um, if your publisher has heard anything uh, from Radu as to a follow-up on the six years that he's been gone and if he's going to write anything about you know, if he was in the interior with the, with these people, with these advanced people, or or if there's anything like well, that. Well, uh, of of course, I would have those questions myself. But yes. as I told you, uh, the publisher said he has exchanged a few emails and he has provided no further information. Okay. I, I have asked him for further information, and I also. Uh, are interested I'm going to send him a large wire transfer uh you know uh -huh. i'd be it right now if i wasn't on the air uh and and 
you know, that will probably uh, bring back a, a communication of sort, sort, sort with it, such as, thank you, I received it, by the way. Uh, if I'm if I'm fortunate, I might even get a letter from Radu. Nice. So um, I uh, and usually Radu seems to have been more chatty with me than he has the publisher. Uh -huh. So um, uh, most of what he seems to have talked with with the publisher is more about business, okay. as opposed to me, where it, it gets a little more uh, into the adventure and the esoteric. So in any case. Um, that's, uh, that's, did you have another question? Oh, the other one was, um, if you could talk a little bit about where each one of the tunnels, uh, goes yes. to. Yes. Well, the three tunnels, um, one of the tunnels goes to Tibet where there is a similar installation, not identical, but similar. Uh, it would be said that the one underneath the Sphinx is sort of the flagship installation, the main installation, uh, the, one that goes to Tibet has an offshoot to an area near Baghdad and also an area near uh, Mongolia. And these also have similar installations, which are not as extensive, again, as the one in Tibet or the one in underneath the Sphinx in Romania. The, uh, and the, another tunnel goes beneath the uh, Mediterranean to the Giza Plateau. And that's the one we're going to be talking about today, the mystery of Egypt. And the third tunnel goes into the inner earth. I will touch upon that. Uh, what I, I think, uh, I think I understand that tunnel very well. It's the most mysterious, but I think I understand it. Uh, I think I have the best beat on that of all the tunnels. And that's, uh, it refers to book four, but in any case, uh, the, when book three starts, um, Cesar Brad, who is the psychic, who uh, was the head of Department Zero, has now been, uh, I guess, promoted to pretty much fully in charge of Department Zero. He's, he's uh, I think he's been promoted to colonel or something. And uh, Radu has been taking care of the alchemist's house. Uh, it was the Lama's idea to let Radu stay in the house and keep it because this alchemist is very wealthy because he's inherited a lot of wealth. He was set up to be wealthy. He did not grow up wealthy. He grew up in a communist country. He was extracted from communist Romania uh, by a secret uh, group of, uh, orchestrated by his ancestor. He was sort of smuggled out of Romania by getting him a passport, uh, a diplomatic credential saying that he was from Belgium. And being that he spoke French, which is what they speak in Belgium, uh, he was able to pass through security um, in Western Romania, and he was wished a, a bon, bon voyage by the communist border guard. Um, now, the, um, so, so anyway, the, uh, he's, Radu is staying in the alchemist house, and he gets a sudden surprise call from Caesar, which he was just thinking about Caesar. And he's just so overjoyed because he hasn't heard from Caesar in a long, long time, at least a year, I think. Now, it's, it's very interesting. Um, these characters that I'm dealing with, whether it be Radu or David Anderson, they don't seem to talk to me for a long periods of time. Uh, it's no different from Radu or Radu's friends, you're dealing with a level of, uh, you know, comings and goings. It's, uh, you know, sort of like that uh, good witch in the Wizard of Oz. She comes in in a bubble and then she goes away just as mysteriously as she came. And, and that's sort of what dealing with uh, some of this uh, phenomena is like. Now, definitely has a magical component to it. Okay, so uh, Radu is, is glad to hear Caesar, and he's basically um, brought to a base. And in the base, I think the base, I'm pretty sure the base is in, in the Buchej Mountains, not too far from the Sphinx, and not too far from the chamber. Uh, this would most likely be near the mountain village of Bushteni. 
uh, which is um, where you can take a cable car up to the Sphinx. Uh, you're not going to get into the uh, um, secret chamber. It's been very well camouflaged, and where it's not camouflaged, it's very well guarded. So uh, I think that I could, if I chose to, and I would not do this, I could start poking around and, you know, get chased out of there if, if, I, uh, if I wanted to. I think I know enough about the layout of the land. I'd, I'd have to guess because I haven't been uh, specifically on that road. But in any case, I would know the general idea of where to go. And I could also find people to, to help me get there. But I, I would not do that because when you're, the whole tradition there is when you're allowed to access it, you will access it. You don't have to push the envelope. You will be taken there. But in any case, um, so basically, Caesar recruits Radu for Department Zero. Radu is basically an independent person. He's a writer when he writes the first two books. But now he's going to be recruited into Department Zero although he's really a civilian, he's not military. So this creates in the future a little bit of awkward situations because he's not strict military per se, but he is a part of Department Zero. So he has to go through some physical training and a great deal of preparation. I said a great deal, we're talking probably like what amounts to a basic training. And I don't mean to suggest that he was going through military basic training, but he was going through a basic training to prepare him for this journey where he would go in this underground uh, vehicle, which had been created uh, with the help of the United States technology. Uh, and this is the most advanced technology that one can imagine. Uh, and, and it's uh, being created for this journey, for this project. So Radu is, is gotten in physical shape and uh, he might have had some mental training by Caesar as well. I don't recall. It's been a long time since I've read the book. But basically, what the plan is, is for um, him to join, uh, participate in a team. And the team is going to include uh, Caesar, Redu, another Romanian, and then two Americans. And one of the Americans, He's the most interesting character in the whole book. His name is Aiden. He would be described as your quintessential tech nerd. But what he brings, now they're going to go in this vehicle, which is like, boy, when they describe it, it reminds me of some sort of uh, beetle-shaped golf cart that's much more elaborate, sort of maybe a little bullet shaped and it's got these sensors. You heard about these Tesla cars that can kind of uh, dictate where they're going. Well, this has sensors that is far in capacity of the Tesla car, uh, in particular the one that recently crashed because it's not relying on just visual, it's relying on feel, sound and everything. So it can go at great speeds and they've got all of the creature comforts because the initial journey through that tunnel did not have such sophisticated traveling gear. And this was created, this gear was, a vehicle was created to um, enable to make it easier for the people traveling uh, in this third tunnel. Now, there's a very sci-fi aspect to this tunnel because when you, when you actually see the tunnel that's near the, what's called the projection hall, it's not, it doesn't, it looks like it has a dead end. It doesn't look like a tunnel that's much deeper than a, than a big closet. But it has an aspect to it where um, it has some form of crystals around it or some sort of uh, devices where you actually go out of this world. So the tunnel, it said that it, so when they go through the tunnel, it's a tunnel, it looks like a tunnel. And it, it sounds like it's a virtual tunnel because they're going through this tunnel just like it's a real tunnel, but it, it's almost like they're going in a parallel world or a parallel time. It's Is that very sort of like the Stargate where they 
you know how they enter into the and then they cross over into another another um, dimension type. I don't know. Uh, I think Stargate, from what I've little I've seen of it, is you just go. You're in one world and now you're in another world. Yeah. It's like wa like Dorothy walking through the door, uh, and going into Oz. No, it's not like that. They're going okay. through a tunnel. They're going through hundreds, thousands of miles of tunnel to get to Egypt. And uh -huh. so it's like a they. He describes it as best he can. He does a pretty good job, but it still eludes you. It's like a parallel. The tunnel is like a parallel uh, world of hyperdimensionality that they have to go through. Now, if if they were writing, uh, you know, he could have made up other stuff if he wanted to say it was a geological tunnel. He states emphatically that the one to Tibet, Baghdad and Mongolia is a physical tunnel, but this one is not. And so they have the adventures of, of the tunnel and they have to stop every so often to take a break, to rest, to stretch. And I think they, they camp out in, in on the way because it's a long journey. So I think it takes them two days and they're going at a rapid speed. So there are adventures at the tunnel when they get to the rest stop, there's uh, old, I guess what you call food and, and batteries to replenish them that were used for the old devices. I think they've got the batteries figured out now that they see all the old equipment. And all of the equipment is described with great, uh, uh, with enough detail that, that it's very convincing. And it's also cutting edge type stuff. Now I'm gonna get back to this interesting character named Aiden. It's, and he's the most interesting character because this is where I found that the book excels uh, if you were considering it to be science fiction. It's not purported to be science fiction. Um, and anyway, Aiden has a computer, it's a laptop, but it is a holographic computer. So in other words, it will, when you open it, it will emit a holographic keyboard, which he would work on a holographic keyboard. And he would. Hold on, Peter. We'll be right back, everyone.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and turn this back over to you, Peter, so that we can make it through um, these two books. But also, when you get a chance, um, it, if you will, talk a little bit about the secret parchment as well. Well, yeah, we've got plenty of time for that. Okay. Okay. So uh, I will try to wrap up uh, the mystery of Egypt here because the, the mystery of Egypt, all right, so we're talking about... Uh, this computer that he had that was a holographic computer and the keyboard was holographic and then the screen would read out holographically. Okay, now Aiden was a genius. He was a, I, I described him as a tech nerd, but he said, uh, Aiden describes himself as, he said it's almost like he has this intuitive relationship with the computer it's like he's kind of part AI. It's an extension of him or he's an extension of it, so to speak. It's, there is a great, uh, a great deal of sympathy wrapped up between the device and Aiden's uh, quality or state of being uh, and mental faculties. So basically, he can figure out amazing things. He can figure out trajectories. He can figure out, he can analyze the, the living daylights out of something. So uh, he's also, you know, a genius. So he's a very interesting character. Uh, the computer is equally interesting. And he also explains, he says, this computer is really, uh, it's a very powerful, amazing device, he said, but this is nothing compared to the, pu the, the computer, the most highly classified computer in the Pentagon. He says, that is huge. And that is a holographic computer, he said, too. So he's telling us, that there is a holographic computer uh, within the secret structure of the Pentagon. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, if any person in, who has high security clearance in the UF gover US government that is close to Barack Obama, that is close to uh, very sensitive areas, and here's this, more often than not, this particular person is going to be on the outside looking in. He's not going to be an insider, you know. And if he was an insider, he's not going to be phoning me up and saying, yeah, I know about this computer. Oh, I know about it. Uh, he's not likely to anyway. So this is the, the level of secrecy we're dealing with. Now, there is one person who frolics in that level of security. Well, at least at least two. One of them is Dr. David Anderson, and another. And I'm not saying he knows anything about this. I'm not saying he doesn't, because I don't really know what he know what he knows and what he doesn't, except that he's uh, chosen to keep silent about about it. Another one is Preston Nichols, uh, who operates from another uh, reference frame, but still he he will have strange associations with security issues, and the more deeper you get into Security issues, sometimes the weirder it gets, the more surreal it gets. And that's only one indication that means you don't belong there. And I mean, you don't belong there for your own good, because if things start to get surreal, such as in Alice in Wonderland, uh, you're, you're likely are prone to become discombobulated. So in any case, um, where what they end up doing is they go to this other area uh, beneath the Giza Plateau, where there is a somewhat similar device uh, to what they, but th it's different. And what, what this includes, it's a lot of what you would call crystal slabs that are finely cut and whatnot and finished, and a lot of crystal uh, devices made of crystals, a big crystals. And, but this device is basically a time travel device where you can go back into time or forward into time, but only with your mind. You do not go physically. And further, the device is bioresonant, which means that if you sit in the device uh, and you believe in things or see things, it's going to be different than what I see or believe. It's all going to be based upon our own biology and our psychology. Now, to what degree it's real, 
we can debate. We don't really know. But this was, so Caesar spent some time going and investigating it. He's investigated it before. Um, Radu is allowed to try it out. Um, the one thing Caesar says is he cannot penetrate the secrets of who built this. This, you know, when you go back in time and you start asking those questions, access denied. Um, he, they are also there, basically the mission is to retrieve these archives. There are a huge amount of what I guess you would call like slate discs, somewhat reminiscent of a, a DVD or CD. And they're, they're described as being bigger than that. And they're, they're slate-like and they're rectangular, as I recall. And if you um, position them in a certain way, they, these disks or, or slates or whatever you want to call them, archival records will read out a holographic pocket of time. It could show you, you know, the year 1800. It, it could show you, God knows what it could show you. And there were this huge archives and they were there to go back and collect as many of them as they could. They couldn't collect them all, there were too many. And they were gonna bring them back to the, uh, to the United States. They were gonna be flown back to the United States and studied. Now, this is one of the more intriguing, uh, I guess what you call speculations that I've indulged in. When I first heard uh, this story of them bringing back these discs or these archival pieces of footage, and it doesn't really state whether they're bioresonant. I don't know that they were, I don't know that they weren't, but let's just assume they're historical records. Uh, like, so I said, well, what are they gonna do? Bring these back? They're gonna need so many people to look at these things, I thought. They're gonna need, they're gonna have to borrow from the CIA, they're gonna have to borrow from the FBI, they're gonna have to have people sign documents, bring in the army, probably the Navy and have, have thousands of people uh, looking at these archives and writing reports on them. It's too much for a team of five to digest. And I said, this sounds ridiculous. Who are these people that are gonna sit there and look at these and write these archives? They're not even gonna be genned in on the process. It would be too weird. Until one day, there's a radio host, um, I believe he's on Revolution Radio, um, Alex Studer, and he's in San Francisco. And Alex had one time informed me of this huge computer that is built under uh, Granite Mountain in uh, Salt Lake City, right, in Mormon country. And it's, it's like the biggest computer in the world. And it would make terabytes look small, make a terabyte look like a gigabyte, a kilobyte. It, 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 these things are so huge, that's the capacity. And then I realized if they're building this huge computer in Utah, and that's probably what they were gonna do with these archives. They were gonna take these archives and put them into a digital slash holographic form because they already had a holographic computer. In, in the Pentagon, if we can believe this story, uh, this computer in Granite Mountain would also have holographic capability and the whole game was to get all this data and put it on the computer. And then you would have the mad minions of whoever's running this thing looking at it and, and you know trying to evaluate the history of time and it would all be done by computer science. What I figured though, and, and this all sounds very sinister because everything in this Utah project sounded very sinister as Alex was um, you know, trying to ferret down, he was, he was fairly pretty well informed about it um, as, as much as an outsider can be. But what, what I basically figured out was that whoever built this device uh, in Egypt with all these archives, if they're going to let the Americans 
take it, there's probably a Trojan horse in there somewhere uh, that would, I, I think, counteract any of the negative influences that might want to influence it. Uh, it's an assumption. It's a speculation. But it's, it's, it took me a while to figure out what are they going to do with all these, these discs they're bringing back to you in the United States because you can't have a, a team of flunkies or even highly educated, dedicated Americans uh, put on that sort of work. It's just not going to work. What, are they going to be taking notes? <laughs> uh -huh. So you're saying that uh, the computer, like the gate, kind of had a, a backdoor to protect itself. That's my speculation. Yeah. I mean, these, these people who built this computer are not dumb. They won't right. let you access it. Um, they have plans in store for this world. And uh, they do not appear or portray sinister. They appear very secret and uh, very elusive. Uh -huh. um, and it doesn't mean that they're good. But they don't portray themselves as being foreboding, but highly secretive, and they will. It, this is what uh, Alistair Crowley said about the secret chi chiefs. He says, "Don't try and contact the secret chiefs. When they're ready to contact you, they will do so." <laughs> uh -huh. You know, the, the secret and, and the, the secret chiefs, by the way, uh, refer to the archetypal. Uh, identities of the zodiac you, know, uh -huh. you, you could you could and you can divide certain you know when christianity came they they put angels all over the zodiac and they reinvented the zodiac with angelic references you can go back and study that if you have the patience to do so but all of they they basically rewrote astrolo astrology with angelic names and whatnot now as far as the last six years is has not radu been spending time with these people or i mean or i guess the people at the end of the tunnel are and are they different than the people that created the holographic computers well we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves now because that's going into book four okay sorry uh, we're going into book four this is sort of you know this is a, a, a nice overview of book three. yeah Right. It's, it, it, we, we'll, we can end it there because, I mean, there's a lot more to the book and a lot more detail, but that's the crux of the story. Mm -hmm. and I suppose when you, you give a talk like this, what you're trying to do is interest people in the story, tell a, a cohesive, interesting enough story, yes. uh, not only to get them to buy the book, but to, to you know, get the story across of what, what, ha what, what, uh, what happens, what has transpired. Right, right. Um, we, we can now go into the fourth book, which is called The Secret Parchment. And The Secret Parchment, uh, the subtitle is called Five Tibetan Initiation Techniques. And these initiation techniques are what are found in the parchment uh, themselves. And this is, uh, this is the, the object in book four is to... Uh, is to translate them. So, um, but it's so Radu is now working in Department Zero, and there is a great amount of political intrigue which resurfaces for the first time in the story since Book One. Book One was full of political intrigue uh, between Romania and America, and it should be noted that Romania and America became allies after this chamber was discovered in 2003. Uh, for the first time in, in the history of Romania, they were staunch allies, and whereas they'd always been on the opposite sides of the, of the fence uh, before, although there was always a, a certain respect for America, uh, I have learned from certain Romanians. But, um, but politically, they, they really weren't allied um, because, you know, Romania was part of the Third Reich, uh, it was, although it was aligned with Russia during the Cold War, Romanians always hated Russia because they had stolen their, you know, crown treasure, right. World War One, and never still haven't returned it. So there is some enmity 
enmity there, although they were, uh, you know, certainly friendly on the surface, but uh, diplomatically. But uh, so anyway, th this uh, alliance between the Americans and the Romanians is getting a little strained. And there's a lot of games being played by the pol politicians in Romania to get at Department Zero. They always want to uh, get control of it because it's the hottest property in the entire country. And of course, the people that want it are not above the boards. So Caesar, who is a very, I guess what you'd say, uh, esoterically, he's trained like a, he was psychic at birth and he's trained, he's a, he's a, a rather pure individual. So he, that's, he has to deal with all these sort of lower motives. And what, what they do, and I'm not gonna go into the politics of it, but they decide to send Radu uh, to uh, America for a remote viewing training program because by doing it, they sort of screw up this, uh, they, they do a counter maneuver to this alliance between the Americans and the Romanians. If, if Radu's over there, it, it kind of continues this uh, political alliance, which means the politicians can't stop in and basically destroy the relationship between America and Department Zero. So it is a political maneuver by Caesar's part, and Radu is sent over to America, where he participates in a remote viewing program, where he excels at it, and he talks about some of the adventures he has in the United States. And I should add that, that Radu always used to say um, that he would, he always wanted to meet me, and he says, I'd prefer to meet you in America. I will feel safer talking there. And David Anderson used to say to me, I'd prefer talking to you in Romania. I will feel safer <laughs> there. Um, he didn't really tell me a whole lot in Romania in, in regards to any of that stuff. But, uh, and Radu certainly, he's, he said one time, he said, he says, I came very close to your house. He says, but I decided not to see you because it might have caused you some trouble. In other words, we could call these astral uh, tags or, you know, because there's, there's, there's spiritual energy that follows this type of secret um, mm -hmm. sector stuff that goes on. And, and he decided that he, you know, might have spared me some headaches by doing this. Right. So um, in any case, um, this is how the fourth book starts out. And then just as he begins to excel and... Uh, there is one American colonel who was harassing him, relentlessly bullying him, harassing him. And this guy is kind of put back on his ears by, uh, um, I think, a general, because he kind of embarrasses the hell out of the colonel. And so, right when, so Radu has kind of passed the, the test. And right when he's one, gotten to the good graces of the general who's over the remote viewing program, uh, a phone call comes in from Romania and he sees her and he says, you must get back on the next plane. You must get back on the next plane. I need you right here. And he flies back on the next plane, military plane. And he is brought to, uh, I think it's called Alpha Base, where uh, um, not far from any of this stuff in, in the underneath the Sphinx. And he is he is in, uh, brought into a secret room or, a, or not a room, it's a conference room. And there he sees the Lama, Dr. Zen, the Chinese doctor. He's in his, now in his Chinese doctor uh, identity. And he has this beautiful uh, Asian woman with him, Shin Li. She's his assistant. Um, She's described as being outrageously beautiful and exotic looking. And he, and the Lama basically explains to him that I'm gonna help you translate this book. I've worked on it and Shin Li is gonna work with you. So she, he's gonna work with Shin Li and she's gonna, now that it's been translated, she's gonna help Radu understand it because you know she's gonna kind of pound on his head metaphorically so that he can get it and help him understand it. And 
this is what he was brought back for. It's important that he must translate this. But then a whole bunch of other political intrigue starts going on. And Department Zero is under further and further attack. Um, the General Obadia, who is over Caesar, is basically going to lose his position. The Americans are very upset with the Romanians because there is this secret, um, well, there is, boy, this, this story gets a little, what, what's happened is there's an American, uh, I think it's a Navy base in Antarctica. I think it's called, it's been so long, Mal, um, Malcor, but it's in Antarctica and it begins to melt and it melts and, and not the base, but there's a, an area near it that begins to melt and it melt. And when it melts, there's this sort of antenna like structure, but it's melting from the inside. It's not melting from the outside. It's on its own time clock of the ice melting, the antennas warming up, whatever we call it. And it mm -hmm. has a, a triangular or triangulation uh, of signals, one of which comes from the, the Jupiter, Jupiter moon, Jupiter's moon Europa. And another one goes to Mount McKinley in Alaska. And another beam goes to an area in Transylvania. Uh, Romania, known as Sarmis Sejatuza. Now, Sarmis Sejatuza is when I went to Romania in 2008, I was told by the professors and esoteric people there to go to Sarmis Sejatuza if you want to understand Romania. They sold me on the idea that I should go. The following year, in 2009, I participated in lectures with Dr. David Anderson and I went uh, to Sarmis Sejatuza uh, with the assistance of a, a friend I had met there, Nicole Veselkovsky. Um, she's now a professor of economics in China. And she speaks many languages. And, and she took to me right away. And she volunteered my second year there to go to this area, uh, which I was a very remote area of Transylvania, which is much better traffic since I was originally there. And uh, it's, it's considered the most sacred spot, traditionally the most sacred spot of Romania and the ancient Dacians. Hold on, Peter. All right, we'll be right back for a second hour, everyone.
Welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio, and I am honored to have as guests with me this evening, Peter Moon. Peter, can you give out your website contact information again, and then uh, digital, let's go back into it. DigitalMontauk.com. I've just uh, put up a, a new website today called the Time Travel Education Center, but in order to access it, you'll have to go to uh, DigitalMontauk.com, and it will lead you. You can sign up for free. You can sign up monthly, or you the best value is to sign up for a year. And uh, anyway, uh, you can find more information on the website. There is also a, uh, it, do, it doesn't yet, I, I'm going to fix it so it links to a new uh, video talking about the website. Um, that's, I, I just released that campaign, but it doesn't quite link to the website yet. But in any case, um, you can find out more information at digitalmontalk.com. Back to the story. Um, yes, I was saying that this area of Transylvania where this uh, third um, beam emitting from this antenna discovered uh, spontaneously rather by the Americans in uh, Antarctica. And so the American, and then there was another one going to Mount McKinley. Mount McKinley, Europa, and uh, this area called Sarmasegetusa in Transylvania. And they uh, discovered, I don't know, the Americans knew there was some big underground chamber facility in this area, and they were very upset at the Romanians for not telling them about it. Now, this gets into a very interesting story. And this is a story that has, in Romania, was, was called the highest state secret, according to this book, much more uh, higher state secret than the chamber beneath the Giza Plateau or the chamber beneath the Sphinx in Romania. This was much more sensitive territory because, and it's important that I should qualify this area because this story is indicative the, it's the story kind of becomes phantasmagorical is the word. It's like a fantasy. But this is indicative of the ancient traditions of this area. And it is also in keeping with the tradition, well, the, the people of themselves. And it also has patterned itself in my interaction with this area and with these people. Now, the average person... Uh, traveler can go into this area and he can spend some time and he can go back and maybe he notices something, maybe he doesn't. But for whatever reason, I've been introduced to this area to resonate uh, at, at the deepest uh, level possible, at least within my own conscious framework. So um, and, and I met, you know, the resident archaeologist of the area, and he told me that uh, much, he'd never heard of any of these stories that I'm telling you. But when I told him about him verbally through a translator, he said, you know, this, this lines up with so many stories I've heard around this, this valley. And anyway, basically, it's what this uh, story is. And, and Caesar tells the story to Radu because he says the Americans were very upset with us because they felt we, we were withholding great secrets from them. And he says, look at, he says, there's very little we know about this area. I will tell you the story. And this was actually in a file and he goes through the security. Uh, this, this information I'm telling you uh, was in a I think a briefcase and it was like held by about four different political people. It was such an important state secret that it would go in this briefcase that was only by uh, reading the cornea of the eye that it would be uh, unlocked, but it would go, it would be like held at just sort of like how the, the Germans, Russians and English uh, and French used to guard Rudolf Hess. They would each take a quarter of the year. Well, they would do this with this briefcase and, and you know, one party 
of the Romanian government would hold it, then another party, and then Department Zero would hold it because it was such an important state secret. And this is the state secret. <laughs> so, of course, they can be dismissed as saying this is just an incredible story. There was a professor, uh, Constantine, in Romania, and he was an archaeologist, and he was digging up. There was a lot of archaeology going on uh, before communism fell in 1989, and it continued after communism fell, but then they were digging up some very sensitive things. Um, people got frightened, and this, this was the big fear. Constantine, one day after a dig, uh, was came back and, and with a, a young man who was uh, uh, helping on the dig, they, the young man, they were putting back the tools and he discovered this area. It was sort of a pit they were keeping things in. He discovered a little underground opening and they kept opening it and it got bigger and bigger. And it was late in the afternoon, but they went down there and the more they went down, the bigger it got. And they went on wow. a they went on a journey that went deeper and deeper. It began to slope, and they went down, and then it went down, and it was an ancient civilization, obviously because it had uh, the stones or tiles or whatever they were. But it was obviously uh, a manicured area, but it was very ancient, very deep, and they kept going and going and going because it didn't end. Where does this go? Finally. As they begin to travel, the the caves begin to show gold and mm. gold veins amidst quartz, and you'll normally find quartz and gold together. Right. But then the gold became out of proportion to the quartz in abundance, out of proportion to everything else until they finally reached pure gold. And it went on and on and on. And they were basically following tunnels of pure gold. And this was astounding in and of itself. And the gold, it's explained in the book, has an effect on the consciousness. It makes your consciousness much more liquid, much more fluid. And so uh, they went and they finally found this bed. They called it a bed. It was like a sort of a platform on the ground, and it had Egyptian hieroglyphics near it on sort of a golden uh, plaque. And it had, uh, it had, well, they didn't understand it, but he took pictures. Professor Constantine took pictures. And they went further and further into the uh, underground with more golden tunnels, and they led, eventually led them to uh, a series of thrones that were in, you know, in a circle of thrones. I think it was seven thrones, if I'm not mistaken. And then there were also sort of plaque-like embedded areas of gold with hieroglyphics behind those. And in adjacent or nearby this was an elliptoid, ellipsis sort of area that was basically a portal to another world. And they were, they looked over, they looked into it. And the professor got a little woozy on this point. He, in other words, it sounded like, you know, what, what reality was he in? He wasn't sure, but this is what he saw. And the young man was looking over it and it, they were looking into outer space. And they saw this planet that was, Reminiscent of the earth, instead of being blue and green, it was orange and yellow with clouds. And it seemed to be coming towards them. And the kid just kind of was in a rapture and he fell into the hole and disappeared. Wow. Like he fell into space. And, and Professor Constantine at that point, says, you know, he got uh, concerned, if not frightened, and began to hightail it back to the... Uh, to the, where he came from, which was a long journey. And the first thing he did was he called the authorities in Bucharest because he had to answer to intelligence or authority in Bucharest. And keep in mind, Bucharest is, is about an easy eight hours away uh, and in the, by car. So uh, 
because this is up in the mountains. And basically, they come and they explore the area with him, but they're all frightened. They're all frightened. And the kid is gone. And they basically hire a uh, cement truck to to cover it all up. The, the officials get scared. They get scared, but the, but the cement driver goes crazy. The cement truck driver goes crazy. So they take over the cement driver's job and they fill it up. And it, where the book ends, they still could never find this place. It was hidden so well. You have spiritual forces hiding this place at that particular time. The, the three, Professor Constantine is taken to Bucharest He's never heard from again. The, the three men from the government who have this secret file that is actually Professor Constantine wrote up all of what happened. And I think he wrote it by hand, but whatever, he wrote it up. And the, the three officials die in a car crash. And Caesar is notified as the head of Department Zero and he gets there before anybody else. And that's how he got the file. He initially got the file. He said if he didn't get there first, he never would have saw that file. And I guess he got the file and he, I, I, no, he didn't, I don't know if he got the file, but he met with Constantine before Constantine was taken away and Constantine told him the story. So he got a lowdown and maybe, uh, I don't know if Caesar wrote it. I forget who wrote it into the file. But basically, that there was this incredible story. Now, um, this is, according to the book, the greatest state secret in Romania. It would, but the Americans were reacting very poorly to the Romanians because they thought the Romanians were hiding this and they were allies. And the Romanians were, the Americans were also very angry because how could a a small country, Romania is not really a small country. It's about the size of Texas. But compared to the Soviet Union, China, Australia, Canada, and America, it's a small country in mm -hmm. terms of size. And the Americans were very outraged at how such a geographically small country and seemingly insignificant country to the Americans, how come they could have all this important stuff happening in their backyard and not in the Americans? The Americans had this, you know, sort of race, it amounts to a racist righteousness that they should have the, the best, most sacred spots. And, and I've pointed out that we do not have sacred ground in the United States of America. Uh, we have some memorials to war, which are considered sacred, but the sacred ground in America was Native Americans and the United States of America has uh, misappropriated the sacred ground in America. So this explains well why this righteous indignation was so inapplicable by the United States of America. But in relation to the Romanians, the Romanians have lived on their soil. They're very proud. Uh, they go back in, in, the, in the ancient heritage of the Romanians has gone into in this book. Um, it explains how uh, the Romanian language is the native uh, in Indo-European language. The precursor to the Romanian language is the Indo-European language. Uh, and that Romanian, and I, I learned independently of what's said in this book, that Romanian, see, that you, you'll be told in school that Romania derives from Latin and it's one of the Romance languages. Well, where does the word Romance come from? It comes from Romania, Roman, Roman, <laughs> mm. Romance language. Well, Latin, uh, Roma, but in any case, the Romanian language is use, um, uses the Latin alphabet, but that wasn't always true. They used to use what's called the Cyrillic alphabet, which is the same alphabet the Bulgarians, the Greeks, or the, the Russians rather, the, the, the Bulgarians and the Russians and the Slavs use. It's the, the Cyrillic alphabet, and the Roman, Romanians used to use the Cyrillic alphabet until uh, a revolution in 1848, it's called the, the Revolution of 1848, which was based uh, primarily on the work of Karl Marx. And there was 
and and the the Freemasons uh, kind of took over Romania. They took some of the the top Romanian scholars and sent them to France uh, under Masonic interests, where they were imported back into Romania to change the alphabet and to obscure the actual ancient traditions of Romania. The language was changed again in the early 1900s. So, um, so if you go back to the root, what, what's the Romanians, some Romanians, a lot, most Romanians aren't really aware of this, where they call it archaic Dacian, which is the you know, original language that Romania is based upon. And he goes into, he gives a very good scholarly argument for all of this, and that Romania was nestled into, uh, well, was Transylvania, what was the key area, because during the Ice Age, Transylvania remained intact. It survived. It was not covered with ice. And it also had extensive tunnels with running water. So the, to, to the degree it got cold, if, if it wasn't okay above boards where they were above ground, they could, where they could still raise crops, they could go underground and they would have water and they could take care of their animals there. So Transylvania was where everybody in Europe receded to during the Ice Age, anybody who was around. And then the culture of Europe emerged from Transylvania. And it is the sort of the ancestral home of Europe. And it's like going home. So, and the religion, the uh, they have the indigenous spirits of Roma of Transylvania are known as the Solomonari, um, which is representative of the words Sol and Moon, Sol and Sun and Moon. And this is way before there was a Jewish king named Solomon. So the the roots go back very deeply. Um, and you, you'll find a, a little town in Romania called Sumera. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. But that's where we get Sumeria, because the ancient people of Sumera went into Sumeria. This is very ancient stuff. So you have nature is still intact in Transylvania, where people who have farmed that, the generations have farmed that land probably for tens of thousands of years, the same family, uh, certainly for the last few thousand. And so you get, when you go there and you drink milk, you're drinking real milk. You eat food, you're eating real food. It has a very a different effect on you because it's nature. And in America, we don't have land that's been, you know, it's, it's like 300 years, if you're lucky, of, of, of a family holding property for 300 years in America. And no, we don't have that. It's a totally different experience. So there's a lot of profound issues that come in the spiritual area. And of course, when I went there, I, I was said, uh, I met somebody who knew Professor Constantine. I was shown where his house was. Um, he was a very real character, quite apparently. Um, so I begin to uh, have my own experiences there. And all of this, I, I should... Um, mentioned that where this bed was, there were hieroglyphics that basically were translated by about four different universities, reduced them to the lowest common denominator, and basically it translated as, you know, this is the center, I, I forget what it said, but it was like, this is the center of all time. It was, it was time sensitive. Now, this is the same general area. I can't say it's the precise area because I don't know where this area is, but it's within, you know, the ballpark of, say, the island of Manhattan. You know, it, it's, it's about that close, more or less, or certainly New York City, the size of New York City, that, that close to where this area, David Anderson told me in this area, according to his research, and he's not necessarily read these books at all, he might have scanned them at most. He said this area is where there was a discharge of a time reactor either 200 or 2,000 years ago um, by the measuring uh, instruments they did with uh, their ability to detect um, time discharges from, a, from a, where somebody's doing time experiments. So there was an experiment done there 200 or 2,000 years ago, which basically melted the sediment in such a way, and that's 
he says nothing but a time reactor could have done that, according to, you know, the geological studies that have been done on the area. So I'm going into this area in August, returning to the cave where I was coincidentally in 2014. I was led there by the archaeologist. I did not ask to go there. But see, this is part of the tradition of that area. They, the, the spirits will appear as shepherds, and they will take you to a cave. And this will be your initiation. Well, this man is not a shepherd, but he's serving the role of a shepherd. And this is the people have this tradition embedded into them. He takes me to the cave. He doesn't know the history of this cave as I know it, as I've been taught it. He knows the, the standard history. It's a big bat cave, actually. And this bat cave uh, was, it has more bat guano or bat shit in probably than any other cave around. And so this was, a, a road was built to it by the dictator Ceausescu to use the bat guano for fertilizer, but more for explosives. So it was a, an instrument of war. And uh, it's at least seven kilometers uh, complex of caves. And I won't be able to go and dig into the whole seven kilometers. I'll be able to basically go on the outside uh, and go into the inside a little bit. I've been into it already a little bit and hopefully have a, a neat experience that'll explain a lot of this stuff. So this is a, sort of a, of course, and of course the secret parchment is also translated in this book and some of the adventures with that. And it gives basically uh, different precepts for uh, living, uh, one of which is is to recognize uh, the divine synchronicity in all things, um, and, and that everything is connected by vibration, and, and to put yourself in with the alignment with the higher world of the universe. Go ahead. All right, and you said uh, time reactor, and so um, that means that there's something that is supposed to be released now to um, the public consciousness, right? And so... So it would seem. Now, that what's being released to the public consciousness right now is that I have done these videos. Uh, I've, been, I've done a, a video series, Time Travel Theory Explained. Now, these videos would not exist without my adventures in Romania, particularly in 2010, where David lectured on these subjects. And he tutored me personally on... Uh, which you'll see in the first two uh, videos of the series. These are available for free. The first is seven videos, um, Time Travel Theory Explained. And these basically explain the physics and math of time travel and show that it is entirely within the realm of physics and math, ordinary physics and math. It's not complicated. Uh, you might need to go over some of the videos uh, two or three times to, to really get them, but they're they're really explained. I've gone to great effort to explain them in easy words. Um, when David read my uh, Montauk Pulse newsletter of uh, summer 2015, where I explained uh, how how these things worked, he was so impressed with it. He said that he says nobody's had the patience to explain it so clearly. Well, these videos are far more clear than that newsletter I wrote. They're far more clear. So I've gone to great effort, but in the process, I learned and understood this, but I wouldn't have been able to understand it had I not spent time with him and listened to him lecture, some of which, which went in one ear and stayed there. It, it, it didn't go out the other, but it stayed there, and I couldn't process, process it till years later um, for whatever reason, and this is the result. Now, so... Then I also have a, uh, the patent for the time reactor that he filed. And that was published a couple of years ago in my book, The White Bat, which is the fifth book in the series. But The White Bat, I put it in there uh, so it would be recorded to posterity. It's now a part of the Library of Congress, and it's in thousands of books. All right. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back for final segment.
Uh, welcome back, everybody. Just really quick news tidbit. A uh, hundred manuscripts were discovered in an Afghan cave uh, just recently, which is going to be interesting because it's a lot of new information that should be coming to light. Uh, but anyways, there was a question for you, um, Peter, too. Yeah. Uh, one was, have you heard about the Mandela effect? And then the other was, have you heard of a Romanian pastor named um, Richard Wormbrand who wrote a book called Tortured for Christ? Uh, no, no to the second question. Uh, the first question I have heard of the Mandela effect. And uh, some of the videos on it are, are really, uh, they're just, they're disinformation. I can't speak for everybody's experience on it, but the they're 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 done by people who are deliberately disinforming people and deliberately talking smack. Um, I can't speak for every experience. I mean, they're just poorly they're poorly constructed in terms of what they're presenting to people. Um, uh, but whatever. Uh, and and basically, the the Mandela effect is a symptom of what you remembered is no longer valid. In other words, it's, it's a form of losing your mind uh, under the guise that time has changed. So um, it's, but this is to be expected in these times, this sort of things happening where people become destabilized in their minds. And um, it's, it's something that one has to look into their own mind. And they will see external changes uh, where this corporate logo is different. Well, you know, the corporate logos change all the time, <laughs> you know, and, and mm -hmm. like David Letterman says, interview with a vampire. Well, the fact that he said it, you know, uh, doesn't mean it was that way. It means that he said it. You know, David Letterman is not gospel. Mm -hmm. Interview with the vampire, you know, who, who remembers this stuff? You know, yeah. I recall it as interview with a vampire, you know, like some people like to remember it as interview with a vampire. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm not uh, I have not seen enough information to make me sub to subscribe to the Mandela effect, but it catches on with people. Yeah, because people in general are extremely suggestible. Yes, they are extremely gullible. And yes. the first thing you have to get rid of, you know. Uh, you have to get rid of it. And it's, but anyway, um, so we're getting into the, the most per, perhaps interesting part of the discussion tonight. And I'm going I'm, I'm to correct myself. I said in that cave, it, it's referred to it as the center of time where there were these hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics. I looked mm -hmm. in the book, and, and the exact inscription on the hieroglyphics, what they reduced it to, it says K-R-I-O. Kur-Io, Creo. And then it says Salmos, S-A-L-M-O-S, Salmos. And these words are, they're kind of in, unintelligible. And then, then it says in English, it's translated into, here is forever, the worlds unite. Now, K-R-I-O is described as, K-R is Kronos, meaning time. I-O, they do not understand. I, they say they don't understand it. I understand it as an expression of the deity. It's a one and a zero, which is 10, which is the dios, but it's also representative of, a, of an ancient, um, in, in magic, I-A-O, um, which refers to uh, the, the create, survive, and destroy. The Salmas, which they do not define here, which astounds me, is the same as Zalmaxis, the patron uh, God of Romania um, and never in the books uh, other than what I've put in the books have they mentioned Zalmoxis Zalmoxis is the most popular uh, traditional God of Romania he is um, Zalmoxis is, is where we obviously get the, the Yiddish word moxie which has been transliterated into English as moxie uh, it's also the root word for Moses Moxi Moses, but Zalmoxis was somebody who was um, trans, 
uh, transformed from a man into a god. And he did this by going into a cave for four years, which is a traditional uh, technique of transformation. According to the Romanian tradition, the Greeks also used it, the Tibetans also used it. So this cave saying, here is forever, the worlds unite. What this tells me is that it is a sixth dimensional portal or reference frame. Sixth dimensional being, and let me explain, fourth dim three dimensions, we all know what that is. Fourth dimension is time, which is a series of events that if you could get outside of, you would see all of time as a series of events, sort of like uh, stopping a motion, a 3D motion picture. Uh, the fifth dimension refers to all potential uh, occurrences, like every um, binary path you could take, like uh, the road, two roads in the Wizard of Oz with the scarecrow. You can go this way, you can go that way. All the bifurcations of existence is the fifth dimension. All those potentials, they are unlimited. The sixth dimension is where you can go from any point in the third dimension to any point in the fourth and to any point in the fifth. That means any potential reality. So when it says, here is forever, the worlds unite, it is telling you that this area is a portal into anywhere, uh, anywhere that can be conceived. And that's what it's telling you. Um, and this is where uh, I will be going in the vicinity of. Uh, what To what degree I will be accessing it uh, or be allowed to access it is, uh, that's I guess that's why we take journeys. Mm -hmm, right. And uh, when did you say you would be going? Very interesting. I will be there uh, during the biorhythm of August, uh, the, the, the famous 20-year biorhythm, 1943 uh, was the Philadelphia Experiment, 1983 was the Montauk Project, uh, and of course 2003 was when they discovered the uh, chamber beneath the Sphinx, and 2023, well, that's not here yet, but uh, every year... Uh, and, and the reason I don't plan it to be there during that time, I'm actually coming home on the last second to the last day of the biorhythm. I'm leaving on the 13th. Uh, I, I will fly home on the 14th, but I will be there during the 11th, the 10th and the 11th and the 12th. Now, this is this happens by happenstance. It doesn't happen because I say I'm going there during the biorhythm. They actually change the date of Atlanticron. It used to be the last week of July. But because of the floods, uh, the island wouldn't dry out enough because it's submerged in water during part of the year. So when the island dries out, so they, they delayed Atlanticron, so it makes it more serviceable for me to be uh, in Transylvania during the, the, the famous fire rhythm. I do not plan it that way. It happens, uh, you know, by serendipity. Right, right. Well, uh, definitely going to be very interesting um, and definitely looking forward to further reports. And uh, hopefully you'll hear from Radu, too, and, you know, get some feedback on his experiences if he's going to be able to release uh, details on that. Um, I know probably all your listeners are, you know, wondering about that, all that. One of the things that's um, stated in the book Transylvania Moonrise very astutely is I think it's the Lama talking, and he says, people think things will never change. Change is, is the most common thing in this universe. Right. So you could be, you know, sitting there with your thumb up your rear for, for 10 years, you know, and you think nothing's going to change, you know. Well, it, you, it will change. You know, it, things will change. So, yes, we can expect that these, like, characters who have disappeared for so long to reappear and under what guise what construct we do not know but I have been much more deeply accepted into the energy of that country I now have a Romanian wife who I met at Sarmis oh, wow. Congratulations. I, I told you that but she's been with me a year and a half now in the United States, and, and we will both be returning to Romania. She has not been able to return because it took about a year to get her green card. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
she can now travel and, and return uh, with no problem. But uh, so this kind of makes me one of them in a, in an energetic level. Mm -hmm. And um, that, uh, that was actually what prompted David Anderson to call me in January of 2015 when I announced, I wrote to him and told him that I'd gotten married and, and, uh, uh, and he, he called me that very night to congratulate me. And that sort of renewed our acquaintance. And he spoke to her on the phone for about five minutes. And she was very impressed at his, Roman his grasp of Romanian. He spoke it very well. I don't know how he can do that, but he certainly is very good with languages. Um, so, so in any case, um, yes, this is, it's as if I'm being set up for a experience because right, right before I go to Romania, I hear from David Anderson, I hear that Radu has surfaced again. Um, I have also received a photograph of Eleanor, purportedly Eleanor, which I have to say looks exactly like I would have imagined him to be based upon the description of the book. It's a spitting image of what I would have put in my mind. So often when you see a picture of somebody, it doesn't necessarily turn out like you thought. Mm -hmm. So the, these characters... Um, are surfacing, at least in the consciousness, to what degree they might surface or manifest. Um, I, I'm going to be Atlanticron, in Atlanticron. Uh, I'm going to be meeting a lot of new people there. I'm not, uh, my circulation with the old guard uh, will be, I think, more minimal than it's ever been. There will, of course, be many recirculation of, of friends, but there's going to be a lot of new people, and I can always count on new experiences, um, spontaneous experiences, and these are always sacred journeys. So um, it's going to be, uh, you know, a very interesting adventure, and uh, we, we will see what happens. I have no anticipation. I have no expectation. Yes. Yeah. Best way to enter into a journey. Um, can you talk a little bit about the... Um, the the secret parchment in, in has there been any work in that regard as far as the translation or it's completed what, and um what can you tell us uh, about that and uh, about you know some of the specifics the five techniques um certainly uh certainly um let me uh draw it up here because what i did okay now these are written out it's not horribly long. When I say long, uh, you know, it's not as long as the Declaration of Independence. You know, it's like one parchment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it might be like, I don't know. But it's, it's a lot of flowery language because they speak in a lot of flower. Right, metaphors. So I created what is called a crib sheet or five precepts or initiation techniques. I consolidated them and simplified them in my own words. I suggest that people read the book, uh, particularly, you know, chapter three of the book, which translates them mm -hmm. and go back into and, and do your own translation. But this is what I, I summarize them as. Uh, number one is compassion. There is a divine source of compassion in this universe, and we need to recognize it and link to it. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't conceive now we all might not experience compassion but if we don't recognize that there is compassion uh, we're not going to resonate with compassion we're going to resonate that's how somebody becomes a devil they you know they say it's a compassion this you know it's a it's a world of broken dreams and and uh, dog eat dog and you know it, it does not make for a, a happy person uh, or a happy world. No, no, exactly. Number two, and this, this is right with Buddhism. All we are is a result of what we have thought. What you think is what you get. This is also representative of the principle of quantum affinity or the law of affinity, uh, sometimes called resonant rapport. So don't, like if, if you go around, uh, you know, fighting people, fighting entities, uh, you're thinking about them too much. 
you know, you want to attract positive thought. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, our thinking creates our, our experience. And, and, and in Qigong, we have a saying that where your mind goes, your energy goes. So this is the very Buddhist type of principle is, you know, they call it right mind. <clears throat> Number three is synchronicity. There are no coincidences. When events or experiences coincide outside the ordinary bounds of probability, this is a meaningful coincidence and there is an intention behind it. Um, this is something that I've written about in my own work. And uh, so, you know, there's all of this stuff I'm talking about that, you know, David contacts me. Uh, right. I'm going over there, Radu contacts my publisher. I'm also uh, sending a, a wire transfer to my publisher, which, you know, when you exchange energy like that, it becomes meaningful on the other end. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, somebody's saying there, well, yes, uh, yeah, he sent the check. We're going to uh, inform him of this. They don't really care about that. You know what I mean? But it, it's right. symbolic of, you know, um, of, of just the transfer of energy between uh, the two the, the two countries, the two areas. Number four is vibration. Everything is connected by vibration. None of these things I've said are particularly new, but they were placed in a parchment to be released at a particular time, which has taken place, and to it will have its own I guess what you'd say, magical confluence that will go with this, which is the uncovering of this antenna in Antarctica, which signals to Mount McKinley, signals to Sarmisegetuza, Transylvania, and signals to Europa. So it's you've got all this like cosmic happening. Right. Five is will. Align yourself with your own higher will and the divine source of creation. Well, these are all very, very common sense techniques. And what I advise people to do when they read the book is just to keep their own crib sheet and go over them on a, on a daily basis, because mm -hmm. it's not much different. It is different, but it's, it's not unsimilar to like uh, using rosary beads and going over and saying these prayers, you know, you're going, you're just repeating, uh, repeating certain things. And if, if anybody who's playing with rosary beads or any other technique of, of connecting to the divine or divination, the most key component is you have, you're creating, you're creating reality when you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're creating reality and it's very important that you put positive energy into this. Um, so th this is, uh, that's essentially what the, what those, uh, five techniques can be reduced to um, in, in my, this is my interpretation of them and people can read the book to get a more, uh, it, it goes into it more extensively than I, but that's the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the gist of it. Yeah. yeah, the gist of it, yes. Yeah, fantastic. Um, very deeply profound. Um, well, we've got like four minutes remaining, Peter, so I want you to just kind of sum up, you know, as far as your own, what you have taken out of all of these books, especially since we've kind of ended on in a very esoteric way with these um, these particular directives and the from this parchment, um, you know, just kind of your last mm -hmm. comment for listening audience and yes, it's these books. I'm basically my role was to be the. Uh, the publisher of these books, I, you know, arranged to have three of them translated. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was translated. They sent it to me in English. Um, I had to, to put it into our English, but uh, take it out of the Euro English style. But in any case, my role was to publish these books. Uh, but it's also become my role to interact with them, write with them, and they've become a part of me and my legacy. Right. This wasn't necessarily intended, uh, but it's what happened. And But you see, these books are all indicative of 
and what comes out of them of what Romania is. Sacred Romania is these spirits known as the Solomonari. They come out, uh, they show themselves to you, they test your heart, and they take you into the caves for transformation. So it's a it's a spiritual initiation, and that's what these books are. In the case, and they're, they're for everybody. I mean, I you know, and, and they're educational tools. In my case, it's become far more personal uh, than I would have uh, imagined, or perhaps it, it just happened this way. I didn't plan on going to Romania and marrying a Romanian woman and uh, having all these interactions. It just it just it just happened, and uh, I'm I'm very happy with it. But it's uh, you know, life is is very interesting. Yes, it is. And more, more uh, arguably of equal or more importance is these, uh, it's all coinciding with the release of these uh, videos on the time travel theory explained. Now, if, if I had released these videos 20 years ago, it would have completely rocked people's heads in a good way, but it would have shocked them because the Montauk Project shocked people. But this science is impeccable. It's, it's inarguable. Now, They've had a limited amount of circulation because we're inundated with infotainment these days. So I encourage people to uh, go look at the first seven videos for free. Uh, and, and, and if you want, uh, eight and nine are about the time reactor, the patent for the time reactor, which is sequestered. It, it's, but this shows the actual filing. It's got the filing number on it and everything. And I also give an explanation of how the time reactor works. Um, so. Basically, uh, and this, this enables real full-scale hardcore time travel. There's no, there's no question about it in theory. Uh, David is the practitioner of it. I have not had an opportunity to, I, I've only got it to see a bit of it on video, but uh, which I, I'm not at liberty to share because I don't have the video and he would not allow me to video it. Um, so in any case, this is um, spectacular information. I'm gonna release, uh, all of these videos to the public when I get a certain amount of subscribers because I have to make it a, a viable operation. Um, much of my energy is shifting from books into web. I still, I have two new books that I'm writing on this website, which people are happy to, or, you know, will, will, will welcome to participate in giving their comments on them um, as they are written. Um, I think that's very wise. I did the same thing. I find that, especially with this generation, that um, they don't like to read. And in order to reach them, you have to create videos or do radio programs um, in order to, you know, really share the message. Yeah, books will never die. And then and then people who want to get more into it, yes, the books are still available. Absolutely. But uh, the Internet is a new... I mean, we, you know, we... Uh, the, today is the official launch of the website, the Time Travel Education Center. But, uh, you know, we've already got a healthy amount of signups without, you know, even before we announced it. So we, we want to get a certain amount and then uh, and we we'll keep continually adding content to it. Some of the content will be of the cave. Um, some of it will be free content. You know, we always want to issue a certain amount of free content uh, and then a certain more of more, I guess, more private content for the people who subscribe and then sort of circulate. Well, hey, thank you, Peter, for joining us. I appreciate you. We'll stay in touch and um, we'll pick it up again sometime soon. God bless all. Good night.